Hello and welcome to uh, this Ray Bradbury virtual session. Today we'll be talking about Hope Punk, which is about having optimism in dystopian futures. And this will be our biggest panel to date. So if you just sit back and relax, we'll be having the panel introduce themselves. So Alec, please go first. Uh, sure. Uh, so my name is Alec Nevalali. Uh, I'm a science fiction writer and uh, occasional biographer and nonfiction writer. Um, I'm the author of a book called Astounding, uh, John W. Campbell, Isaac Asimov, Robert A. Heinlein, L. Ron Hubbard, and the Golden Age of Science Fiction, who was a Hugo finalist a couple of years ago, and uh, talks about the origins of science fiction and uh, the environment in which uh, writers like Ray Bradbury and the, the guys I just named emerged. Fantastic. Uh, Jake, if you can introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Jake Sell Brookins. Uh, I'm a science fiction scholar and reviewer for the Chicago Review of Books and a couple other places. Uh, I'm mostly here today because I run Positron Chicago, which is a website for speculative fiction book clubs and other events in the greater Chicago land area. Fantastic. Uh, Keisha? Uh, hello, I'm founder of Sugar Gamers. I am also considered a futurist. So I'm all about tech advocacy and inclusive communities and ethics. Uh, so that's what I do. Fantastic. And uh, Marissa? Uh, I'm a short fiction writer. I do both science fiction and fantasy. And in recent years, I've branched out into both poetry and essays. So my main presence on this panel, I think, is because I had a recent essay about the nuts and bolts of writing optimistic near future science fiction in a time that is not making us feel necessarily very hopeful on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's my background. Okay, which is a perfect uh, transition into our first question. Do you mind uh, talking a little bit about that essay that um, helped spark this panel? Sure, um, Uncanny Magazine, uh, ran this essay that I wrote in its most recent issue, I think, still. Yeah, that's right. They don't have another one out yet. Uh, it came out in September. And uh, I was talking to Elsa Schoenerson Henry, who is, uh, sorry, just Elsa Schoenerson now, who is the nonfiction editor there about, you know, would she be interested in running something that is not just the value of optimistic near future science fiction, but how to get there. Um, because I think it's very easy to exhort writers, say you must give people hope, you must give people positive ideas, but that's easier said than done. And so um, when I said, would it help? Do you think it would be a positive thing in the magazine if I wrote something like this? She said, absolutely. So that's where we ended up with that. Uh, and I, I tried to talk through, you know, if you go and read the essay, there are several places where I feel like I wanted to give people a toehold, either for coming up with their own optimistic near future SF, or even just thinking more hopefully about their day to day lives in the middle of all of this. Uh, and as I was writing it, I, I said in the essay, you're going to be able to tell which week I wrote it. And you'll say, oh yes, that was the, the week with arson in the Nantes Cathedral. That was after the murder hornets and before, and I put a bunch of question marks, but of course we all can kind of list the horrors that kept coming. So it's, it's a time that's easy to find that sort of thing. And, and I think harder to find the hopeful bits, but they're still there. Okay. And I think it's good to open up to where everyone does feel on the panel, how does everyone on the panel feel? Does everyone feel that we are in a place where we should be focusing on hope and optimism, especially we have an election right around the corner? Or where does the panel feel we should be on this topic? Just so we see where everyone is like point so if we know we have a point counterpoint, if we can go through the panel on this. Um, well, I guess I'll, I'll uh, start. Um, I think that hope and optimism needs to be tempered by pragmatism and reality. Uh, we, we need to be open to 
things that are uncomfortable and unknown and uncertain to us. And as Americans, we tend not to like really like uncertainty. We tend not to like things where we have to interact with uh, sort of subject matter or concepts that are different from what we're anticipating. Um, the privilege of being an American has allowed us to sort of coast on some things. And, um, you know, one of the things that I really enjoy about speculative fiction and more specifically, the, the thing that I've really been doing a deep dive on recently is this idea of solar punk. Um, and how we can all sort of uh, contribute to future that we all want to live in by expanding the conversation about that future to be inclusive and ethical. Um, and that's not necessarily easy. And I think that a lot of people kind of misconstrue hope with ease. And I think that as we move forward into the future, things are going to be a little bit more challenging, but that's not necessarily bad. So if that makes any sense, yeah. that's where I stand. Okay. And if I can open this up to Alec and uh, Jake, whoever wants to go next in regards to this, where you both stand in regards to um, hope and optimism given science fiction. Well, I mean, I, I'm personally fairly pessimistic uh, about a lot of things these days, yeah. um, but I understand the need for hope and, and I understand, um, you know, the, the sort of the most positive way I can frame what's going on right now is that it's forcing um, everyone to kind of rethink certain assumptions they've had that um, I think are very ingrained, especially in America. Uh, you know, things about what is power, you know, what is power used for, uh, is power something that, um, you know, people should seek uh, how do we deal with her our heroes? How do we talk about charismatic figures, um, you know, on all sides of the uh, political spectrum? And what is the need for people like that to say about us? Um, and how do we talk about institutions and systems that we take for granted? Um, you know, to me, one thing I want to talk about maybe later before I step on anyone else's comment is uh, there is a strain of optim optimism in science fiction that's been there for a long time, but it takes weird forms. It, it takes forms that I think are kind of troubling uh, where the solutions are based on technology or they're based on these heroic figures that um, technically are, they're solving problems. You know, they are making things better within the context of that story, but um, the, the needs of a narrative and the needs of a story that needs to have a strong protagonist and someone who's got agency and, and can sort of like proactively deal with the situation, um, I found can be very misleading in terms of how we try to address those problems in the real world. Okay, and I, I do, I have that down to, to come back to in regards to your book. So we will be touching on that again, what you did bring up. Uh, Jake, do you have? Yeah, um, absolutely echo those comments. Um, I think I'm always really kind of cautious about the word hope because I think a lot of times people use it in a way that's synonymous with wishfulness, um, which is not what we need right now. Um, and, and I'm extremely skeptical of, uh, you know, extreme techno optimism, um, this idea that, you know, someone will just invent the Wu-Bang gadget that sucks all the carbon out of the air or whatever. Um, but I think with science fiction, I've been thinking a lot lately about um, the books that I walk away from feeling more optimistic are not necessarily rosy ones. They're not necessarily ones that have really happy endings, but they're ones that um, really kind of get into how bad things are or could be, but not in a way that revels in it. Um, books that um, try to get away from that kind of like, you know, triumphant, Campbellian kind of myth like Alec was talking about of you know one heroic figure does everything and thinking more about um, more about collective struggle more about communities persisting um, more about gradual change um, and I think to to get there a lot of that fiction doesn't necessarily look very optimistic on the surface um, I'm thinking about stuff that really grapples with climate change things like um, um, things that are kind of willing to embrace how bad some things are now and, and think about reacting to it, um, which may not come across as very hopeful, but I, I often come out of those works feeling a little more optimistic because people are taking it seriously. 
Great. And you've brought up some stuff that we are definitely going to deep dive into. So I want to thank everyone for touching on some things that we are all going to be talking about in their topics. So this was a great preview for everything that we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to talk first with Alec because Alec's book and Alec's topic lays the groundwork for the golden age of science fiction. And if we can go a little bit more into, you know, was the golden age, you know, are we, was there hope or are we always, or are we drifting away from that notion of hope? Um, and if I can give us, you know, an example of that to build into when we go into some of the stuff Jake talked about, if we look into Fahrenheit, um, 451, where it is a bleak world, but with some simple acts of people just choosing to read a book and some keep some books of live, we are changing the world a little bit in this notion. Um, so I'm giving a tease for the next question uh, for that, but uh, if we can expand on what Alec was talking about in the golden age of science fiction and how we drifted away from that. Were these concepts of just furthering the space race, this concept of colonizing um, and the go-go American spirit or was it propaganda or was it actually hope and inspiration? So when I say the golden age, you know, this is a chronological marker, all right? It's not yeah. necessarily a saying that these stories were better than the ones that came afterward, but, you know, fans, some fans at least, have agreed to refer to the period between roughly 1939 and 1950 as the, the golden age. And um, it's relevant to what we're talking about here because a lot of these stories, at least in the slice that I know best, were influenced by an editor named John W. Campbell. Um, and, and when we talk about Campbellian science fiction, you know, th that term refers to what you could, ref you know, think of as a kind of optimism. It it's about solving problems. Um, and Campbell had a very particular idea about how problems should be solved and who was going to be doing the solving. Uh, you know, he comes out of this tradition that, um, you know, the pulps, uh, you know, they came out of a, you know, um, the market in the 1920s um, for science fiction was in pulp magazines. And a lot of these stories were adaptations of stories that, previous writers had written in genres like the Western, in nautical fiction, in adventure fiction, that kind of have a stock protagonist. You can kind of picture this kind of square jawed white male hero who tends to dominate these magazines. And what Campbell does uh, is essentially takes that character, which has been proven to, to work on a narrative level and, and transfers him into a futuristic or, or, or you know, like an outer space setting and, and you know, says, okay, we're gonna tell these stories about these kinds of heroes but this is a hero who is going to solve problems using technology. You know, he's going to solve problems scientifically. He's going to solve problems using engineering. And, you know, this figure becomes known as the competent man. And so a lot of the stories from the Campbell period uh, are stories where there's a problem and the main character solves it by inventing something or, or finding some kind of, you know, scientific solution that is, is grounded in real science but it's usually one person or a small number of people working independently who, um, you know, they're able to kind of like treat every problem as a subset of engineering. And this reflects Campbell's point of view. You know, he was very powerful. The stories he picked, the authors he published, you know, retent, you know they tended to be authors who um, were sympathetic to that point of view. And so there is definitely an attitude in um, the science fiction that we're talking about that says that, you know, things are going to work out. You know, Campbell very rarely gives you like a dark, depressing ending. You know, usually by the end of the story, the problem is solved. Um, but the approach is, is you know, a very particular one. Um, and you can understand, you know, kind of where this comes from. You know, uh, Astounding became uh, a major magazine in the years leading up to World War II. And, you know, after Hiroshima, mm -hmm. you know, after uh, the bomb drops during the Cold War, Campbell kind of sees that as his moment to take charge of the genre and, and maybe, you know, uh, come up with an idea that will actually make a difference in the real world. Uh, and so these are, these are technical problems that Campbell thought of as, as having technical solutions. And, you know, he never kind of stopped feeling this, you know, this is kind of, 
you know, after 1950 or so, he starts to become a much more marginalized figure because people are asking, well, what about problems that can't be solved by technology? Or what about people that don't have agency? What about victims? What about people who are kind of left out of this heroic picture that you've painted for us? And Campbell said, you know, those people don't interest me. You know, readers want to read stories about heroes. And so a lot of the dystopian darker fiction that comes out of the new wave in the 60s is actually a reaction to the technological optimism of uh, the Campbellian period. So, you know, the, the, the sort of like the, the short version of all this is that, you know, science fiction, it's a series of actions and reactions. You know, each generation kind of like takes apart what the previous generation did. And, you know, if hope punk, if, you know, that's what we want to call it, is a reaction against dystopian fiction, you know, or against grim dark fiction, you know, that's fine. But the one thing that we have to kind of be cautious about is that by reacting against that, that we don't end up back kind of in the Campbellian mode that says that these solutions can be um, implemented in certain ways by certain kinds of people. Okay. So building off of what Alec just said, and I'll open this up to the panel. Do you feel that there's a threat that with Hope Punk, it's going to backpedal to a concept of more of a utopia, or do you feel that Hope Punk is like a Fahrenheit 451 that we are in a dystopia, but these smaller acts of kindness are what, you know, we're planting the seeds, kind of like maybe in A Parable of the Sower, the work that we see in Octavia Butler so is what we're leading to. So my understanding of the Hope Punk Manifesto yeah. is that it is an exceptionally broad movement. I don't consider myself a Hope Punk writer, um, but I suspect that Alex Rowland, who is the person who wrote the manifesto about Hope Punk, would consider me a Hope Punk writer because the way that they have conceived of Hope Punk as a movement is incredibly broad. So I think it can include if you're going to talk about hope punk specifically, I think it can include um, neo Campbellian optimism to the point of not really being optimism anymore, neo Campbellian wishful thinking. Um, it can also include exactly the kind of small act positivity that, that you're in a dystopian setting that you were talking about. I was really glad that Keisha brought up solar punk um, because I think that that's a, a very focused movement and it's one that I feel in in the essay that we were talking about earlier that I wrote I, I tried to draw a line between wishful thinking and optimism and part of that line was is this based on something where there are steps from here to there um, is this possible to get there and so one of the things I really like about the best solar punk is that it is not doing stories where it's just somehow magically someone has a device to suck the carbon out of the atmosphere and as you know as Jake was saying and we're all better that instead I think solar punk focuses a lot more on the experiences of the people living it and the communities that they're in and so when you get an optimistic solar punk story it's genuinely optimistic. It's groundedly optimistic rather than pie in the sky optimism. Um, so that's what I find promising about that. Awesome. So Keisha, do you feel comfortable hopping in and going a little bit more into solar punk? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, first, you know, to like sort of bring this together again, uh, punk what does punk mean? When I first like delved into solar punk, my youngest brother, he was just like, this sounds very utopic. This sounds overly optimistic. How is this punk at all? Because punk is the embodiment of rebellion. It's the, you know, embodiment of individuality of, you know, just the, being an autonomous person uh, or, or an autonomous group of people. So, uh, you know, punk to just add it on to something is, is really interesting. So as it pertains to solar punk, um, you know, as I understand it defined is basically what you know about cyberpunk, but instead of destroying the world, 
we live in harmony with the world we we are thinking we're using our human intellect to create more egalitarian environments um and to get to that point would take rebellion as it pertains to how we live at this moment so to get to that utopian oh man we're so hopeful and we're so happy it takes a lot of discomfort it takes the opposition to what we're comfortable with and that's the part about like t having this discussion that i think is so important because you know to to have hope we really need to be purposeful and specific about the kind of future that we want because in a lot of the narratives that we read we rely on this obscure hero or this obscure technology to save us. But really, as it pertains to hope punk, as it pertains to solar punk, what I am seeing, I mean, it's all speculative fiction, but what I, what I see in, in all of this is that we as individuals are the heroes of our own story. And so we have to actually contribute to the overall narrative in order for it to work. So there is no hero, there is no, no magic, there is no, you know, super, you know, Elon Musk isn't going to save us, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, and this is why this conversation is so important because as it pertains to speculative fiction and science fiction, to encourage people to use their imagination to conceptualize of things uh, in the future that don't currently exist as their own individual selves is very empowering. And that's how we get to a realistic, pragmatic way of hoping for a better future because we have a part in it we have stake in the game we're not just you know sitting back not doing anything passively waiting for something to happen and that's kind of punk right and punk being a punk is kind of hard because you're not necessarily immersed in the collective majority that is going to go in a certain direction. One of the, the things I really like about Alex's work is that you, you know, he's really deconstructed how all of these uh, science fiction works have came to pass. And what's happened in our society is that we follow incrementally improved successes. We're too afraid to innovate. We're too afraid for new ideas. And so then therefore we're just like, we're gonna be like this person, but just slightly different. And right now at this point in our society where we really need hope and we really need new ideas, we all need to be like thinking about our own experiences and figuring out how we can add something tangible, something uh, important to this conversation. Um, and so in that, that sort of vein i think that this hope punk and you know and hope punk and things that are attached to hope punk like solar punk is, is very empowering to the individual uh even more so than it is to the collective because then we have to as ourselves be introspective to really think about what part we want to play for the future that we want to see excellent so i think if I can tie this together, what we are looking at in this is the one thing is we're not looking for a, what, you know, Campbell would say like the Messiah figure to bring it all together and say this, but, you know, real people working together, trying to make it all happen. Can we, Give some examples, if I can ask everyone, that we see in current media fiction that um, people watching this panel can turn to, be it video games, media, movies, t television, literature, that everyone would feel that, uh, as far as what we're discussing, would be examples of, of good examples of people working together to a tangible, optimistic future where everyone has to work towards something. Well, I think um, the point that we had earlier about how not the most optimistic works aren't necessarily the ones that look initially optimistic or upbeat, 
uh, really pertains to the trilogy that Christopher Brown has finished this year. Um, it's got uh, Tropic of Kansas is, I believe, the first book. And there is some grim stuff in there. But there are people who are figuring it out and working together and dealing with, you know, dealing the hand, <laughs> playing the hand they're dealt, as I guess, dealing with the problems that they're given and finding a way to do better for the next piece. So in some ways, it's kind of ironic to talk about Chris's books as though they're optimistic because there is going to be a lot of nastiness in them. If you have not read them, they're definitely not a book where fluffy bunnies have a picnic. Um, but I think they are some of the most grounded in the current reality and trying to find space for a better world from there. And I really appreciate that about them. Yeah, I mean, one I will always go to is P.D. James's Children of Men, uh, too, as an example, where it's, you know, it's a dystopia, it's something horrible, we're maybe looking at the extinction of the human race, and people are working towards maybe, I'm trying to be spoiler free, saving the human race. In, a, in the scenario of the book. Uh, if I can open up to the rest of the panel, some examples of uh, current media where we're seeing examples of what we're talking about on the panel. Yeah, I, um, if I could jump in, I, I just finished reading um, Kim Stanley Robinson's new book. So it's very much on my mind, uh, The Ministry of the Future the Ministry for the Future, um, which basically imagines what if the Paris Agreement had teeth um, and could actually get some stuff done. I mean, he's one of you know quite a few science fiction writers who've been really concerned with the environment for a long time. And um, for me, what, what makes that kind of writing hopeful is um, being willing to really embrace and look at how bad things are now and what we've lost now and mourn that a little bit um, and then think how we're going to move past that. Um, so he's definitely someone I, I think of in the kind of like solar punk genre. Um, I'd also probably recommend Cory Doctorow, um, if only because he consistently comes back to the idea of, um, organized labor and, um, you know, community organization as like a, a real way to affect change, even in some of his more utopian stuff like walk away, which is imagining, you know, like, true post-scarcity society, he's thinking about how that works societally in small units. Um, I don't know, I think there's, there's a lot of people working on it. And I think one thing I've noticed thinking about this topic of, of hope punk and being optimistic about the future is I feel like there's less and less core, like definitely science fiction that fits this for me and a lot more peripheral fantasy and, and more speculative um, things. I was thinking about uh, Margaret Kiljoy's books, um, which are very punk um, and more fantasy, but just again, thinking about how do small groups kind of like come together, decide they want to do something, work together to get it done. Um, yeah, I'll list those for now. Um, well, the one that I had in mind, which actually came up, um, I was looking for like at a list of books or works that might be considered hope punk. And this is not a recent book or a work of art, but it's one that I've thought about a lot over the past few years. And uh, this is uh, Tony Kushner's Angels in America, um, which, uh, you know, doesn't, I, I think if that, that play were produced for the first time today, we'd absolutely see it as a work in like the speculative fiction category. Um, and not just because of the angels uh, and like those fantastical elements, but the way he builds that world and those characters, you know, it, 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 for me, it falls right into the main line of SFF. And, um, you know, if you're talking about a, about a dystopian America where a small group of people has to figure out a way to survive, you know, you don't have to read Fahrenheit 451, you know, like if you were a gay man living under the rigid administration, you know, dying of AIDS, you know, that's your life. And um, Angels in America to me is the quintessence of hope punk because it is hopeful. It's funny. It's a survival manual full of strategies that you know, people develop to kind of just endure, you know, in like the worst possible circumstances. And it ends on this incredible note of, of optimism. You know, everyone who you care about has survived and 
you know, um, you know, the very last line of that play is the, the great work begins, which I think is sort of what co punk should be about. It's, it's, you know, not that the fulfillment that you're looking for has arrived, but you've survived, you've learned a few things, you have friends, and, you know, you can start to think about, you know, what comes next. Um, I mean, basically, just what Alec just said uh, about, like, you survived. Um, so I don't necessarily know if I have interacted with anything that's whole punk or even solar punk uh, in a way that is uh, is consumable for somebody from where I come from, right? So, like, if it's too optimistic, it's not punk, you know. And if it's if it's too, you know, like happy and hippy dippy, then it's not uh, a realistic point of view to me so like I mean I know this is gonna be weird but uh Cormac McCarthy book uh Cormac McCarthy's book The Road to me was incredibly hopeful even though that was a dismal book right um and the reason why it was hopeful is because it, it puts the reader into the lowest of the lowest space it's like oh man you know like this is a terrible place to be in how do we survive how do we move forward? And what I, I really enjoy about narratives like that is that it puts the it puts you in the mind space of really acknowledging the smaller things that we really should pay attention to. Like, oh wow, food tastes good. Fresh air is amazing. Like being able to survive comfortably is nice. And once we're there, I feel like we can rebuild upon what we know humanity to be. Like we've gotten, you know, so, you know, innovative with our technology, but our humanity hasn't caught up with our intellect. So when we're, when we're creating different hopeful works uh, to inspire people, we kind of have to ground them in a, a space where hey, there's there's another direction that we could go in that's even worse, whether that's extinction, whether that's destroying the, the world or whatever. And that's what dystopia does, but it leaves us there, right? It leaves us in that space of like this dystopian ideology. Whereas like if you can take that and then move it to like, well, hey, here's a here's a story, like this is where we're going, but maybe we can stop it before we get there by really acknowledging what makes us human and 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 accepting that and and living that way now instead of having to go through all of this hardship in the future to to understand what we already know which is accepting our fellow human being which is not destroying the place that we live which is not expecting for Jeff Bezos to put on us on Mars you know what I'm saying like we're not all going to be there so we need to you know, again, um, so like for me, I don't necessarily, I know you said mentioned some works that are, that are like hope punk, but I don't really know of any. Um, like I know what works make me feel hopeful and they're usually pretty dark first. And then there's this, these protagonists that figure it out for themselves and they figure it out in a very humanitarian way. So they're not like destroying each other to figure out how to solve problems. And in that creativity and that hopefulness is where I find that nugget of inspiration, not in like, all right, I'm about to read a book about how to be hopeful in the future. Like that's ever how it's worked for me. <laughs> I, to I totally have the road on my list for that. It, 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 it was my number two to list after Children of Men, so. All right, all right. <laughs> I'm not so, alone. That's a dark book. Yeah, it's, <laughs> so. it's, it's beautiful. Now, since you mentioned Mars, and this is the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum panel, what of Ray Bradbury's work would we put in a discussion of optimism? You know, I could. Uh, we can either discuss Fahrenheit 451 or others of his work. So my favorite Bradbury is The Illustrated Man. Um, and it's an, as a short story collection, and maybe this is my short story writer bias coming through, 
you know, maybe Alex is going to jump on this team with me. I don't know. Um, but I feel like he has the opportunity to do more varied things. And so there's some incredibly bleak work in The Illustrated Man, and there's also some incredibly hopeful work. And I think I don't categorize Bradbury as either an optimist or a pessimist. I categorize Bradbury as someone who believed passionately in the continuity of the human experience. So the things that are amazing um, about being human in some of the ways that Keisha was talking about with um, the, hey, let's appreciate being out in the fresh air and the food tastes great, you know, being with our families or even just having some kind of long distance communication with them. Bradbury was always aware of those, but he was also always aware of the continuity of the darker side of human nature. Um, and so I have a hard time pointing at any one work of his and saying, okay, this one's optimistic, but that's not what he was doing. It was a thread that he could use. You know, his, but his main thing was about the human spirit, I think. I would totally agree. I mean, my favorite Bradbury is the dark Bradbury. I, I love his kind of like twisted dark stories. Um, my favorite Bradbury story is um, called Mars is Heaven from the Martian Chronicles, which is really scary. Um, so, you know, I, I, when I think of Bradbury, who I'm actually, I'm not a huge Bradbury fan. <laughs> I, should, I should probably put this, you know, up front. Um, you know, I think he does have a lot of limitations in terms of, um, I mean, maybe a, a more, like a deeper reader of Bradbury would, would disagree, but I feel like in Bradbury, there's a sense where he confuses his nostalgia for certain kinds of American symbols for a coherent set of values. And, um, and I, I think a lot of the America that he talks about is a myth. And I think that it's a myth in the same sense that it, it is in Walt Disney's work. Um, I think Bradbury and Disney actually have a lot in common. You know, they were, they were kids who were always nostalgic for their middle American childhoods, which they didn't really have, you know, and they moved to Los Angeles and they never stopped trying to recreate that memory. And, and I think it's, it's powerful and clearly appeals to a lot of people, including me, but we have to kind of like look past to kind of see, you know, the, you know, the, the sort of like his blind spots or, or the ways in which he, that, that view of the world is actually incomplete. Um, the one story I wanted to bring up because in some ways it is a failed attempt at a whole punk story is um, a story called Way in the Middle of the Air, which is a story from the Martian Chronicles that is Bray Bradbury's attempt to talk about black space travelers. And the story is basically about um, these white racists who are on their, their stoops watching every black person in town leaving to go to Mars. And, and you know, it's clearly on the side of, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's sort of like making fun of these old white racist guys. Um, but the thing with that story is that, you know, Bradbury shows them leaving and then he has nowhere to put them. You know, they never appear in the rest of the Martian Chronicles. And he recognized this. He, he actually, uh, I believe he wrote like a little short story that explained that they actually ended up going to Venus by mistake because there was nowhere for them to fit into that world that he created. And so I think, you know, it's a story that reads okay you know, when you first look at it and you're like, okay, well, these people are going on to a better life. Um, but then Bradbury just can't follow through. You know, he, he can't quite follow up on the implications of what he's done. And so it ends up being this kind of like weird dead end in a otherwise, I think, amazing collection of short stories. Yeah, I was, I was trying to think about Bradbury in, in context of hope punk and, and kind of coming up dry. And I don't know, I think Marissa, you hit it like he's, it's not that he's pessimistic, but he's, he is fundamentally backwards looking. Um, and I mean, the, the Martian Chronicles hits different now because we all know that if we do go to Mars, you know, yeah, we're going to be working in an Amazon fulfillment center for $12 an hour. So that takes it away a little bit, but yeah. Um, I, I love, I love about his writing that attempt to capture that nostalgic um, feel of living in a small town, but it doesn't feel vital in a futuristic kind of way. Um, it's definitely, you know, it always has this kind of dreamlike quality that he's trying to get back to. Um, and I think it's especially, it's become weirder for me reading Bradbury since I've moved to Chicago because Waukegan's right there. And it does not evoke any of his stories um, when you go there. Um, it's a very different landscape than, than he paints, um, which I know is a passage of time as well as, you know, memory. Um, I don't know, he's a, strange, he's a strange writer to try to read against the future. There's something about the, the Martian 
the Martian Chronicles particularly, which I love, I love that collection, that it, it feels like it's not about the future. And I think I would have thought that if I'd read it at the time, um, it's, it's more this, it's more this fantasy land that's really interesting and rich. And I love the, the weird parts of it. I love the surreal parts of it. Um, but you never think it's actually about Mars. You never think it's actually about space travel or what we're going to do, you know, in the year 2,500 or whatever. So I don't know. He's a weird writer to sit with about that. And, you know, I should mention that, you know, one reason I love the story of Mars is Heaven um, is that it starts out as this nostalgic recreation of this small town. And then you realize it's actually like a, a false front nightmare. And, you know, to me, that's a story that, that you know, Beverly does it occasionally. He, he sort of like takes his own nostalgia and, and uses it against himself or against his characters, you know, to sort of say, you know what, all this stuff that you thought was real is not. And that maybe if you look back, if you look a little bit more deeply, you find that it's actually um, there to, to entrap you. And he, he does mention that in other stories, like there's the playground where that's haunting too. So he will deal with the, the haunting of nostalgia and the dealing with age with something wicked this way comes also. But um, I think I would also like, since we're talking about mainly as short stories, another short story I would like to mention, um, since the election is coming up, because I think this is a good uh, parable for the election and what we're talking about, since everyone individual has a say and every individual's action has a ripple effect is um, Sound of Thunder. Because what's um, bookended is an election, a presidential election between a very hopeful candidate who wins and a very dictatorial, dictatorship type candidate who didn't win but through the actions of the main character in the short story ends up winning and changing the course of America. So, you know, I think I would recommend for folks to reread that short story with the election in mind and just know that everyone, you know, everyone's actions has a, um, a ripple effect. Is that the same one that, would, that starts with them like hunting dinosaurs? It's the hunting dinosaur story. Okay. But it's while he's waiting for the yeah. to go back in time, they have the, the announcements and everything like that about the election. Hunting dinosaurs feels uh, particularly appropriate this uh, this presidential election. So. Exactly. So it's um, something something to think about when you reread that um, short story. And um, and also, I wanted to have this panel before the election, um, just because maybe some people may not have some hope and optimism going into that. So a simple act that everyone can have going into the election is everyone does have that option to vote. So we encourage everyone to partake into their right as American citizens to vote. Um, so that message aside, I would like to uh, wrap up this panel by uh, thanking all of my guests. So thank you all. Can everyone kind of go through and tell everyone watching this panel where they can find you on the World Wide Web and any work that you have coming up? All right, and, I'll start. Uh, yeah, we'll just go through the or in the order that everyone introduced themselves. All right, uh, so I'm Alec Neville Ali, uh, N-E-V-A-L-A hyphen L-E-E. -E. So if you uh, look me up online, I'm on Twitter. I have a blog that occasionally gets updated. Um, and I'm actually currently uh, working pretty hard on a biography of a man named Buckminster Fuller, uh, who was an architectural uh, designer best known for uh, geodesic structures like domes. But he was a futurist and he was, he, you know, in a lot of ways he kind of embodied what we're talking about here because he was seen as an optimist. He was seen as someone who, did think that things were going to get better and that mankind had a chance to make it. But you look more closely at his message and the, the means that he wanted to, to use to get there, and they start to look a little bit more troubling. So uh, sometime in 2021, uh, hopefully that book will be available. Great.
Uh, I'm Jake Casella Brookins. Um, I have a blog and I'm on Twitter and a couple other places, but mostly I would direct you to positronchicago.com, um, which is a site for speculative fiction events in the greater Chicagoland area. Um, if you're looking to join a book club or find a conference or an author talk, we try to list all of them on there. Um, I have some reviews coming out at the Chicago Review of Books, and I'm currently working on a long, very meandering thing that I need to edit down uh, about this is how you lose the time war and its use of uh, poetic imagery um, that hopefully will be an ancillary uh, review of books in a couple months here. Um. I, I'm Keisha, I, again, <laughs> so, but you can find me anywhere under Sugar Gamers. Um, my personal website is gokeisha.com. Our latest project is a tabletop RPG called Project Violatia, which is all about um, sort of playing as yourself in a future world in which every decision has unintended consequences. So there's no 100% evil there's no 100% good uh, and all those like sort of polarizing moralities are gone from the game. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, you know, uh, we're, we're also working on making sure that um, we create inclusive communities to have conversations such as this one. Not everyone is necessarily exposed to the merits, the intellectual merits of speculative fiction, of you know what it means to engage in with your imagination so that's something that we work heavily on to to create inclusive communities and to highlight people that you normally don't see in this space so that's sugar gamers or if you want to find me i'm at gokeisha.com well i use my name marissa lingen for uh my twitter handle you know my name and face are on all of my things so if you look for Marissa Lingen, I'm the only one, um, and I'm also at marissalingen.com. Um, I have also a newsletter monthly that'll tell you what I have out this month and what I'm working on, but I have stories coming out from both Asimov's and Analog in their last issue of 2020, so it's going to be kind of a busy time promoting those for me, and uh, the Asimov story also will be their featured story with a podcast. So I read my own story for that podcast. So you can listen to me talk some more if you want. Um, and that'll be up on the web, uh, I believe the first week of November. I'm not entirely sure, so. Well, I wanna thank all of our panelists again, and you can check out all of their work. Please support them and also check out what's going on with the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum in Waukegan, Illinois. Check out this and other Walk, uh, Ray Bradbury virtual sessions that we have. And thank you for supporting us. Thank you very much.